you know, like starting a church is a little different because whatever you do in your individual life may not be what you do as a church, right? And um, so I was researching and studying, refreshing on Halloween. You know, what is Halloween? And uh, when you study that, you're like, man, this is really a pagan yeah. holiday. Mm -hmm. And now we do Christmas, but the thing is Christmas is when Jesus was born. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference because what do you what's what's ha what's Halloween? What what do we celebrate? Well, that? Day. Yeah, but that's not that's the day right? after that. I know. But I'm just saying I don't really celebrate yeah. anything that has to do with Jesus on Halloween. Right. And uh, so why why would we celebrate? But that's how it got in there. It was the I think it was the Irish I think, right? They, they basically were pagans brought their pagan stuff over and then people got saved and then it was part of their culture. And then they just kind of adapted it and said, well, let's just do this instead, you know? Um, and then it kind of grew from there. And then the Pope got on board with it, one of the Popes, and then um, it turned it down. And they made like a couple holidays out, like three of them, I think, like All Saints Day. And I don't know, there's like three different ones they were going on. But, but I was thinking, it's all related to like the black cat, the jack-o'-lantern, you know, cutting out the, they would use gourd, you know, or, or whatever, but. Um, or just your baby. It's all part of pagan <laughs> worship, really. Which is satanic, you know, it's about the dead coming and interacting with the living on the dirt, no, on the dirt, but on Halloween. And um, so, you know, I've been to churches where they do, we did, kids would come dress up as, as biblical characters, you know? And then we went to another church, and I was kind of like, oh man, this guy doesn't do that, he's doing a harvest party, not on Halloween. And, um, but then when we did that, I was like, that's actually better to me, because it has nothing to do with Halloween, right? We just have a day of fellowship with the believer, and it gives us something to do to get together and have a harvest party, right? Um, but then Lucy, my friend, uh, her and Tony, they have like an evangelistic heart. And so they've been passing out Bibles every Halloween and basically sharing the gospel. And how many Bibles did you do out last night? We gave out around 45 new, new and Old Testaments and about 30 Old Testaments. And then we had coloring books for the children and we must have given out around 20 or 30 of them. Wow. So how cool is that, right? So every child that came up and with their parents, we asked them, can we give it to them? And they said yes. A couple of parents even took the right. full Bibles. Yeah. All right. So that's really cool. But I was like discerning, you know, because I'm like, well, how do we do this? Because, and I just think next year that we will do like the harvest party that's separate from Halloween. This is for us to come together as believers. Um, but then on Halloween, I think it'll be more of a evangelistic outreach, and we'll approach it like that, you know. Um, because, you know, otherwise, I don't want it to be where we bring the youth, and then we participate in Halloween, you know what I mean? So I'm like, that's not right, right? Yeah. I don't want to encourage that, even though my kids, I'm always fighting them every year, you know what I mean? Um, and, uh, but I think this, we just, it's not a big deal. I'm not trying to make a big deal out of Halloween or whatever. But I'm just trying to think, as a church, like, what do we want to encourage? And, um, you know, anything that I think that, I know that anybody that loves the Lord, anything that the Lord would not be happy with, we wouldn't want to be partaking with, of, right? So I don't have a problem at all missing Halloween, <laughs> really. I never have, you know. But I've been in the middle kind of between my children and my wife, because my wife is like totally anti-Halloween. And I've always just been kind of like, you get, they got old enough, and I was like, you pray about it, man. You want to go trick or treat and that's between you and the Lord, I tell them, you know. My wife's like, no, we went, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, but it's a good balance, you know. But, I mean, it's just the way we live and everything that we do. We want to glorify God in everything that we do. And our culture is going to be changing in a lot of ways around us that we're going to be challenged, you know? I mean, that's something old. We've always had Halloween. But 
you're gonna, we're going to see a lot of things changing in our culture that are really going to be challenging to the believer. I mean, already I see it where Christians are getting like angry at like the opposite party or whatever. And I'm like, well, dude, that's not really representing Jesus though, you know what I mean? But anyway, I don't want to let me get into that stuff. But um, but it is, a di- it is a different trial that we're in as believers because we are visiting here and we're all about Jesus. But yeah, I'm proud of my country, I'm a patriot, yeah, man, you know what I mean? Um, but anyway, we just have to be in prayer and um, whatever you do with your own family, I just pray that you are the head of your house and that you guys pray about that stuff. And, um, and whatever we do corporately as a body, we do the same. <laughs> we just be making sure that we do things that represent God and we mean, that draw us closer to Him. So that was last night, but it was, I have to tell you, I'll probably tell you in my message, so I'll just keep going. Um, it was amazing last night. It turned out to be just so incredible. But I'll tell you about it later. Um, so this morning we are in John, still John chapter 17, we just turned the chapter, and um, man, this is a crazy chapter, because I was thinking and studying, but I feel good because I'm on common ground, like any commentary I read, they all feel the same way, and it's because this is the Lord's Prayer, right? So when we think of the Lord's Prayer, we think of like, like Matthew 6. But this is legitimately the Lord's Prayer because Matthew 6 is more um, a template for us how to pray. That's not really the Lord's Prayer. That's Him showing us how to pray. Where this is actually the Lord's Prayer. And we get to watch as our, our Savior is praying to God. Like, this is amazing intimacy. And so when we think of prayer, you know, we think about us praying to God. We think of corporately we come together and we pray. But it's not often that I think about, like, what about when Jesus is praying, right? And that's what we get to look at this morning, is Jesus praying. Like, we see him pray all through Scripture. You know, going up on the top of the mountain because no one else is in shape and he knows they won't go up there. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> um, No, but just, uh, we see him praying a lot. But this chapter, we're... It's like we're there. We see the mind and the heart and the spirit of Christ, which is incredible. So it's like holy ground, you know? Like, so how do you expound? We're not going to expound on this scripture, right? Let's expound on Jesus' prayer. You know what I mean? It's like, how do you expound on that? Like, his prayer is perfect, you know? We could just read this chapter and be done, you know? And I do want to encourage you guys, though, like, whenever we go through the scriptures together, in a sense, that's kind of what we do, is we are all individually filled with the Holy Spirit. We have a relationship with God. And we're just growing with the Lord, right? And when you study your Bible at home, as you read through the scriptures, God speaks to you the same way he does when we're here together, right? Except maybe more things may, might come out, but we're all going to have different applications. And um, so I, I try not to be so much caught up on when I'm studying to teach on making sure there's the application all the time. Because I know this, I'm not going to bring the application, right? Jesus knows exactly where you're at. He knows what's going on in your life. And I guarantee you when we're going through the word, he's going to bring you the application that what applies to your life, you know? So um, I guess I just wanted to encourage you in that, that um, if you're spiritually awake, God can be speaking to you through his word. And we should be saying, how does this apply to my life? So this morning, you know, we see all kinds of examples through prayer. First Kings 8, we have Solomon's prayer. Genesis 18 is Abraham's prayer. And then in Exodus 32 is Moses. And then here we have John, uh, John 17, Jesus praying. Probably the most amazing, you know, most important section of the whole Bible when it comes to prayer. So it really wasn't Matthew 6, 9 through 3, but I wanted to put that up, or 9 through 3, 13. I wanted to put that up anyway and just read over it really quickly, because this is our template for prayer. And what I mean by that is, this isn't something we just repeat, right, and, and ran, you know, rub dub dub mix in the ground type thing, right? But it's a good template for 
knowing how to pray. Like the way he starts off, the way he, what he doesn't miss, uh, what he includes in there, like the, the heart of it, right? And so it's not that we have to pray a certain way, but this just gives you like a really good template of what prayer is, you know? So let's just read through that together. It says, Matthew 6, verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, that you will come. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, not mine. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this, this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation. I like that because it doesn't say, go be tempted and I'll save you from it. He's like, no, be smarter than that. Don't be in temptation. So we pray, Lord, don't lead me into temptation. That's the beginning of our walk is not when we get in temptation, then we pray. No, we say, Lord, keep me from temptation. Right? But deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this is the Lord's prayer, what we would call the real prayer, John 17. In John 17, where we're at, Jesus is going to conclude the upper room discourse where he's been hanging out with the disciples and preparing them for his departure and making sure that they're equipped and even giving them things that they probably don't understand at the moment, but they're going to receive the Holy Spirit. God, they're going to receive understanding, and it's all going to make sense. And in this prayer, when we look at Jesus praying, it's really cool when you look at it as a whole. You'll see Jesus prays about things that have to do with the past, like concerning his glory. And then you'll see things he prays of in the, in the present as he prays for the disciples. And then in the, end, in the end of his prayer, towards the end, he prays for the church, which he's praying for the future. And I'm like, man, that is so cool when you notice that. Because we have a God that he lives outside of time. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I just can't express like the depth of what that means for a believer when we grasp that we have a relationship with this God, this resurrected Son of God that is not even in time. I think that's so cool because sometimes I'll forget to pray <laughs> for somebody or something. And I'm like, hey, that's cool. I still pray. I just go, Lord, you're not in time, so I'm going to go back. I'm praying before that took place, Lord, <laughs> you know, if I don't know the result yet or something, it's cool, you know. Um, but if, or you can pr pr just pray like that. Pray, pray uh, confidently that whatever you're praying is going to happen and pray even if you're not there or you missed the time and you don't know what the result was or whatever, still pray, you know, because he's not contained to time like we are. And that's just so reassuring because um, he's got your... He's got your past, your present, and your future all covered. And today, Jesus, we know, is making intercession for us constantly, continuously. And that's just incredible when you, if you stop and just think about that for a minute. So he's got you covered in your yesterdays, your todays, and your tomorrows. <laughs> that's just so amazing. Um, and so there's a reason why this text that people call the holiest, holiest of holies of, of Scripture um, and like volumes and volumes have been written about it, but volumes more could be written about it, and but nothing is going to meet the expectation because who's worthy to speak or say or expound anything upon Jesus' prayer? You know, so it's really, a, I was like terrified to teach this section of scripture because you're like, right, this is Jesus' prayer, man, this is serious, right? You don't want to mess that up. Um, and you're not going to be going, well, what? Jesus meant to say there was, you know, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just kind of going, well, he said it, and uh, so I think the way I was approaching it was more of looking at what surrounds his prayer, and like the topics, the things that he's praying about, and just looking into those things, right? We don't need to expound root technically on like necessarily what Jesus prayed, but speaking of holy ground, last night was so incredible. Um, so we go, and there was tons of kids there, man, <laughs> at the house, and eating pizza and hanging out. And then even a couple of girls, it was their birthday, they, they came, Alana and Cheyenne. And her mom 
mom came and her mom brought a friend. So uh, I thought she was your guys' friend because she was just hanging out like it was her, you know, that's cool. No. She's just hanging out with Lucy like, you know, like they've been best friends forever. And um, so I walked in late because I was studying, you know, and, uh, but I wanted to show up. And uh, I was just blown away by how many people were there and how many Bibles they passed out. And all my days of food they had, too. <laughs> but um, it was so cool because as we're there, I started to smell pot, <laughs> marijuana, right? So I'm like, who's smoking marijuana, man? <laughs> so uh, um, I'm like looking around going, okay, where's the marijuana, right? Because I smell it. Um, well, I went outside to the backyard, and one of the kids that's in the youth, he's really having a hard time. And because he's lost his parents, like it's not even been a year yet, right? For uh, this guy. And so he's really struggling where he's at with the Lord. And he's young, right? He's very young. Um, and so he has a friend with him that's as young as he is. We're like 12, right? Or 14? Yeah, 13, 14. 13, 14. Um, and so those two are hanging out. When I come outside, I see the two little ones. And then in the distance, I see like two bigger people. They're like 16, and the other one, I think, I don't know how old he is, but uh, they're obviously they're like tripping because I come out there and they were like, oh man, we're in trouble, right? And uh, they were like in the neighbor's yard in the back, kind of away from the house. But I was like, dude, we, everyone upstairs can smell it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it was like, totally. And so um, the two were trying to, and they're like, I'm their youth pastor. So they're like, dude, no. We're, no, we're, you know, we're not doing nothing, you know? And, um, and I smelled them when I was like, they're warm. I know they weren't smoking. I was a professional pot smoker, so. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, you, you can't hide that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you smoke pot, you're gonna smell like it. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to know, I just grabbed their shirt and smelled them. I'm like, well, he has been smoking pot, so it's not him. Um, and I'm just like praying, okay, Lord, what, what do we do here, you know? And, um, but I'm just being cool. Well then, the, so those two were trying to basically not confess that they've been, that somebody's been smoking pot outside. Um, and then here comes two, the two older kids. And the way I was acting, they, they weren't nervous or afraid or anything, you know? I was just like, hey man. So I said, was it a joint or how'd you guys smoke that, you know? <laughs> and the guy goes, no man, it was this bomb we made. <laughs> <laughs> so he shows it to me, you know, like, you know, and I'm like, man, that's a good weed, man, you know, that's skunk bud, you know. And he's like, yeah, I got the good stuff, you know, and I was like, yeah, so that, yeah, it smells good, you know. And, uh, <laughs> Let me read your right. So, <laughs> so then one of the little kids goes, are we in trouble? <laughs> and I was, I was like, no, man, like, um, Instantly, it was amazing. The Holy Spirit was on the scene, and it's weird because my heart was thinking that I was going to be there for the youth, the, the youth that's in our youth group, but it wasn't about them. It was about this other kid, the kid that had the marijuana, and uh, it was funny because I told the kid in the youth group, he was like, "How do you know everything?" You know? <laughs> 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 um, but I'm like, sprinkled the sermon, though, too, you know what I mean? And, um, but so the kid that, that had the marijuana, it turned into just me and him, and it was like nobody else was even there. And the whole conversation was about Jesus and about just our relationship with God. And I'm like, not about pot, but why you would ever do anything like that is because you're in here, you know? You don't have to. And this guy knew the Lord about the Lord. And so I was like, wow, he was like really knowledgeable. And I was just thinking he was just like me when I was a kid, you know, I'm like I knew about the Lord, but I didn't know the Lord. And so I'm not worried if someone's high or drunk or on marijuana, because I know you can, some people would say don't pray with them or whatever, they're not gonna get it, they're stoned, whatever, we'll pull them out, that's not true. Because I was on mushrooms when I got saved. <laughs> so I, and I was sober instantly when I prayed that prayer. And so I, I don't even care about that. You know, to me, that's not even an issue. God is way greater than any drug, more powerful, and you know, just, so I just, we just had this conversation, and um, 
I don't know what was going on in his life, but the Lord's been really drawing him, which this is how it always happens, right? Whenever you lead someone to the Lord, you don't know what God's been doing already. And it's just a divine appointment where you show up and you're, you, maybe you're there in the middle and you're just a seed, or maybe you're there and you're the, the one that gets to see them come to the Lord. And that's way cooler, right? Um, so I was like so blessed because this, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I just let the kid know. I said, dude, you don't know. We don't know if we have tomorrow, you know? But, and I said, I don't know. I know, Lord. I look back now and I see where he was pulling me, drawing me. I said, but I don't know if you look in your life now, you probably will see. I believe. I said, you could probably see where he's been calling me, man. And he was like, yeah, you know? And uh, he knew. Everything I was saying was like, he just knew. And so I basically, we ended up talking for oh, an hour and a half or something. And then he prayed out loud with his own words. And he said, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Uh, man, it was amazing, man. Um, because it was just awesome. I mean, it's awesome to be part of that, right? So that totally happened. But it was strange because while that, we were talking the whole time, the Holy Spirit's moving, the other kids that are actually in the youth group were like totally being a distraction bouncing the basketball and all this. and But they don't really know. But the enemy's totally using them, right? Trying to give that kid an escape, you know? Just one moment where he, his mind goes off and he says, and he walks away, you know? And so I just look at them and say, stop it, dude. And then I just kept going. <laughs> you know? it was like, and they were like, oh, okay. You know? But it was just, the spiritual warfare was heavy, man. And we were even, me and this young man, his name is Caleb, but he was, a, we were talking about the spiritual warfare as it was happening. And he was describing to me, like, how he, and he had internally, he wanted to surrender everything to Christ. But then, you know, the, his flesh, you know, was crying out and going, you know, no, you don't want to let go of everything, you know. And um, well, it was just such a cool experience. And then afterwards, when he got saved and prayed and everything, the other kids, they were kind of doing their own thing. But I know they knew what was happening. So afterwards, the, the, the two other kids come up to us. And it was like, they were like on holy ground, man. They like knew. They were like, whoa, you know, like, something just happened, you know? <laughs> it was just making me think of this, uh, what, uh, what we were just talking about here about this text. How it's like the holiest of holies. It's like we're on holy ground. We're moving into this section of scripture where Jesus is praying. And it reminded me of those two young kids when they came up and they knew what had just happened. And they were just, it was like, they, I swear I was going to wait for them to take their shoes off, you know, because they just knew. And it was cool because I don't think either one of them was a boy, even though they, you know, one of them from the youth group. Um, but it's just so cool that God is really working on it in that. And, and then the other lady that was there, I come in the house and I'm telling her what happened and telling Lucy what happened. Well, I thought that she was friends with Lucy, but she's not. She's friends came with the other girl. And she's like, I think she's a witch, man. Because <laughs> she had like that ring with a pentagram on it. And, uh, and then later on, I, after I was sharing with her, what was going on, I didn't know, but God was speaking to her, you know what I mean? <laughs> sharing with her. And Lucy was already sharing with her, you know. And then she, she started saying stuff, looking about energy. And then I, I knew, oh, okay, she's not a believer, you know. But it was just sweet what God was doing, you know. And I'm excited because I believe all the kids are going to get saved, man. Um, and so I just wanted to share that, that. That was amazing. And the way I tied that in is because we're on holy ground this morning, right? And so volumes of, could be spoken, but this is we're looking at Jesus, Jesus praying. It's a three-part prayer, basically. So we're going to break it up into three sections, um, three messages. If you want, if you take notes, you can, this is how it's pretty much divided in verses uh, one through five, Jesus prays for himself. With that part one, part two, next week is verses six through 19, Jesus is praying for the disciples. And then also verse 20 through 26, Jesus is, uh, he'll be praying for the church. Um, and I just wrote this down <laughs> so you could read it with me because I think it's a really cool saying. A friend of mine says this all the time. It takes a whole lot, excuse me, it takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian to reach the whole world. And so the reason why I was thinking of that is because 
I was thinking, what's the title of this message, right? Well, I would just say it's the, whatever the theme is, right? Um, so the theme is Jesus is praying for you, right? That's, that's basically the title. Um, like, I'm, it's never like trying, I'm not trying to be something like this clever, like, amazing series thing, right? Like so, sometimes guys do that, which is okay. I'm not saying that's bad. Um, but it kind of makes it easy when you just go through the Bible verse by verse because our series is verses 1 through 5, <laughs> verses 6 through 19, verses 20 through 26. That's our series, you know, we're doing John chapter 17. Um, and so the reason why we do that is because it takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian to reach the whole world, right? So Jesus prays for you. That's our title, part one. So you can say, you know, this is our series for the next three weeks. And so Jesus, I, I, want, I think he wants to, I, I really wanted to read this quote because uh, I think it'll prepare our hearts before we dive into his prayer. So just read this with me. You don't have to read it out loud, but if you want to see Jesus Christ, think about him. Occupy your minds with him. If men in the city walk the pavements with their eyes fixed upon the gutters, what does it matter, though all the glories of a sunset are dying the western sky? They will see none of them. And if Christ stood beside you, closer than any other, if your eyes were fixed upon the trivialities of this poor present, you would not see him. If you honestly want to see Christ, meditate upon him. I love that because when you read Jesus' prayer, it's simple and it's straightforward. And you can just read right through it and be done. But I think we're called to really just meditate upon what Jesus is praying because it's important. Or it wouldn't be in there for us to read. Um, and that's why I wanted to break it up into three sections, because I didn't want to just go through it at one time. And it, it's already got a nice and laid, laid, uh, outline. And so first, Jesus is praying for himself. Um, let's read through, though, the, first, the next five verses that we're going to be covering this morning. It says, Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father... The hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. And as you have given him authority over all flesh, he's like speaking in the third person, right? As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So there's a lot here. Um, Okay, I was going to read through the whole thing. Let's do that. I was going to read through the whole Lord's Prayer, and I forgot. Let's do that, though. Let's just continue reading through it until we finish the chapter, because it's short. Uh, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they, they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you, for I have given to them the words which you have given me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me. Through their word, verse 21, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us, 
that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, you and me, that we may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and I have loved them as you loved me. And so, after the Last Supper, that which was in the upper room, they leave. And Jesus' public preaching has ended. There's nothing to be done right now. A miracle, nothing is going to be done anymore. Other, there's one thing left, and that's to die. That's what's left for Jesus. But he's going to pray until he's praying to prepare himself. So he's not going to be instructing the multitude. He's not going to be healing the sick. He's not going to be um, you know, roaming the earth as he has been. But he's going to be, he's going to res die, resurrect, and he's going to be spending special time in intercession for us, constantly, sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father. And so we get to hear his soul in life right before he dies and gives it up as he's praying to the Father. So this is an amazing moment, an amazing prayer. And here we get to look at the heart of Jesus. And so he's going to set out his, we see like his desires, and his requests that he lays out before the Lord. And what's amazing is some of them are about our behalf, which is even more incredible. So what an amazing chapter. Verse 1, Jesus spoke these words. So this is, these, this is his prayer. And it talks about his position as he's praying. As he's praying, he says, his, lip, his eyes are lifted towards heaven. And he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. So right now we know we're in between, they left the upper room, and they're in between the upper room, and some, uh, they cross the valley, and then they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. So they're somewhere in between there, on their way, and Jesus is having this moment with his father, after he's spent this time basically educating the boy, right, for the last time. And we see the position that Jesus, what, he's looking up, his eyes are up, right? And I, it's so funny, because just recently, the kids in the youth group, during prayer, their eyes were open, and I was like, yeah, close your eyes. And then I read this this week, and then it's like, oh, Jesus is like, oh yeah, I have my eyes open. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's just cool, because the culture, they, then, they prayed with their eyes open. And that's why you would see them stand like this, too. Um, and so it's, it's just neat because it doesn't matter how we pray. It's not about the, um, the uh, like, it's not the religious, what do you call it, like rituals. Or, it's not about that, right? It's about talking to our Father and praying. And so Jesus, though, I love the fact that he's looking up. He knows where his help comes from, and he's praying. And I just tell the kids, close your eyes, because if you can't pray without laughing at them, maybe you should close your eyes. <laughs> you know? But man, if you can pray without laughing, I think that's a great thing. You know, if you're an adult and you are serious about your, your, about your prayer time, that's so cool to pray, I think, looking up to the Lord, you know? But I'm just, I'm really used to praying with my eyes closed, though. So, I don't know. So the next week we'll all be praying like this, right? So, uh, they would raise their hands, and we see that from Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, where it says that men pray everywhere lifting holy hands. And so, that's just the scripture in reference to uh, that culture in that day, they would pray looking up and they would even lift their hands, lifting up holy hands. First Timothy 2 8. And so Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. So we remember in verse 12, we saw, um, and now he's speaking of the hour that has come. Well, before it was always the hour has not come. Well, now the hour has come. In John chapter 12, we saw. It says the reason why Jesus came, John 12, 27, uh, should be up on, on the screen. Now my soul, Jesus speaking, is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. So Jesus doesn't, this is why he came. This is the, the hour, the reason that he came. And it's not, it's going to be a more marvelous hour than the, the hour he spent doing miracles and anything else he did on this earth. 
And so Jesus is going to give himself over because it is time. Now it's time. And we know what this hour consists of, the hour when he's speaking of the hour. We know it consists that of Jesus being glorified. We know that he's going to depart from this world. And we know that it's going to be a time when the disciples are going to desert Jesus. And also that he's going to be arrested, he's going to be tried, he's going to be crucified, he's going to be buried. All of that is summed up in this hour. And it's not meaning like an hour in time, but a section of time, right? not 60 minutes. <coughs> um, but Jesus prayed, glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. And so Jesus' request, the request is that, that yeah, the Father would glorify him. But, but when you keep reading it, Jesus, so I love this because you know people say when you pray you shouldn't pray for yourself because you want to be humble and you pray for others right and we're like that's not true um, I think if you don't pray for yourself then that's foolish um, I mean Jesus even prayed for himself but yeah how did he pray for himself you know glorify your son why that your son also may glorify you and so, yeah, Jesus did pray for himself um, that he would be able to glorify his Father. It's not a selfish desire. That's not the background. And that's the same with us when we pray um, that it's to glorify God. But the truth is, you can't glorify God without Jesus, without help from God. So if you're not praying for God to help you, <laughs> to help you, you have to, we have to pray to help him to glorify him, which is kind of sad, I think, sometimes. I'm like, Lord, I'm sitting here praying Help me so I can glorify you. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> because my heart is, I want to glorify him. But the thing is, is I know. And I, I, we're, we're, we're flawed and we're weak. And so all, you know, most of the time I pray, Lord, help me glorify you. you know, Because I can't do it. That's not how Jesus is praying. He can do it. He does it. But just to see that Jesus does pray for himself, he's praying to himself, but to glorify God. And that's how we should pray. Not with a selfish desire, but that, that I can glorify God in everything I do. And I think if you're missing that, it's sad because there's a lot of power in prayer. And so well, I think we should be praying. God, what are you doing in my life? What's going on in my life right now? Like, can I point to one thing that Jesus is doing that he has his finger on in my life? So it's not always comfortable, but when he does that, you know he's working on you. And that's a good place to be, right? And I think if uh, I find myself talking about things that God did in my life like three months ago, then I kind of go, what's going on today, you know? And so that's kind of a, just a, a little picture that I have for myself, like as a check, to say, what's God doing in my life today? You know, if I catch myself talking about something he did three weeks ago, right? And uh, so right now I'm on a kick. I, I can talk about what happened last night. <laughs> um, but, you know, in a few days, hopefully there'll be something different to talk about, right? Glorifying God and, and whatever else is taking place in your life. But look at John chapter 6, verse 39 and 40. It says, this is the will of God, the will of the Father. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. So we've been given this power in the name of Jesus, not to seek for our own gain, but to seek to glorify him. And uh, to not ask God to help you be faithful or to help you walk in the spirit or to be constantly in prayer without ceasing like we're supposed to be praying I think that's kind of foolish um, remember the last thing that Jesus said before they left the upper room John 14 31 this is the heart of Jesus when he's going to the cross this is the last thing he said he said, but that the world may know that I love the Father, 
and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. And so that was the last thing he said before they left, uh, before they left the upper room. And so Jesus is willingly going to redeem man from sin through his own blood. And this is his demonstration of his love for the Father. And so as we see Jesus loving the Father by laying down his life, like, that's how he's glorifying him. So when Jesus is talking about being glorified, he's speaking of him dying on the cross, of him fulfilling the plan of redemption, of being obedient and his flesh being torn, and that the, uh, the holiest of holies, that we could enter in, the whole new court of God's grace, because uh, he took our sin. And it's been washed away. And so Jesus is obedient, and that's always what it turns into when we love God, right? What does, Jesus, what does the Bible say? If you love me, then you obey me, right? And so Jesus speaks these words. He lifts up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. And so that's the first thing we should pray in the morning is, God, help me surrender my life, right? Um, when I wake up, like, I pray that he's the first thing on my mind. I pray he's the last thing on my mind when I go to bed and then on my mind all throughout the day. Because we have to pray, like, God, help me surrender because I have my own will, my own way, and if I just go off in the morning, which is easy to do when you wake up, because you want coffee first, right? And then once that starts, it's like, there's something else your flesh needs, something else your flesh needs, something else your flesh needs. And then you're like, dude, it's 3 o'clock and I haven't read my Bible yet. Then you just kind of go, oh, well, I guess I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> you know, it's like defeated. And so the first thing we have to do is, Lord, help me surrender my way to you, to your way. Help me that I can follow you, that I can glorify you in everything that I do. And as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And so I love this because he's speaking of eternal life. And he, he, and he gives like a, a definition basically of what he's talking about. So as you have given him authority, speaking of himself, over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And so uh, Calvinism, not, no, not Calvinism, <laughs> but, um, but God the Father has given to Jesus. And it's, the Bible speaks of that, that no one can even uh, say, we can't even, uh, it's all through Jesus, right, to, to get to the Father. And a lot of times when we speak of eternal life, we think of like a quantity of time, right, like uh, a distance or how, a length of time. But instead, Jesus isn't talking about a quantity of time, he's talking about a quality of time. So when he says, I, you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. He's speaking of them living for eternity, but the quality of eternity is different because everybody's going to live forever. So he's not saying that they're going to live forever. He's really saying, yes, you're going to live forever, but you're going to live forever with God, with the Father. Because everybody lives forever. Really, we're all immortal if you think about it. It's just, where are you going to live for eternity? Where are you going to be for eternity? And so, even the wicked are going to exist eternally. But the amazing thing is, where are you going to exist? Are you going to be with Christ? The difference is the nature of that life. Not the, not the quantity, but the quality of that life. And so, eternal life is not a reference to how long, but exactly the quality of that time. Because remember, God's not in time. And this is eternal life, that they may know you. What is eternal life here? Jesus explains. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And so life is not found in an academic knowledge about God, like that the kid yesterday. He knew about God. But he didn't know God. 
before I was saved. I knew about God, but I didn't know God. And so that's not what it's talking about. Life isn't found in just in knowledge, but it's found in, if you know the word um, that we're going to come to, it's gnosko, and it means to know, but it means to know with experience, not just a thought. And we'll, and we'll see that in a second. Because um, even the demons have a good theology, right? They know information. They believe God, even says. They know he exists. But they don't know God. They don't know of the Father. They don't know of the Son. Because that's not what he's talking about. Salvation is not brought about by having just intellectual theology. That's not it. I mean, people can know the whole Bible and not, not be saved. I've seen that multiple times. Well, the word gnosko means it's deeper. It's deeper than that. And it's that your experience, it's, it comes from only experiencing the relationship. When you experience the relationship, that's how you get to know. And that's the knowledge he's talking about. He's saying that uh, this is eternal life, that they may know you. So gnosko, that they will know you. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, I think we read this recently, but I was just talking to my brother and we were rowing <laughs> in lines. He was a Christian. He's a Christian, but it was just encouraging. I was like, man, it's awesome to have fellowship. But we were talking about the scriptures. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have not, pro have not prophesied in your name. Have we not cast out demons in your name? We've done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And I would expect there for Jesus to say, well, you did that, you did this, or you didn't do that, you didn't do this. So he just doesn't do that. Um, that's why I didn't go out to the kids last night and go, you're smoking pot, you know. Because that's not going to happen. It's not about them smoking pot. It's about them that they know Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Because that was my question. Why are you smoking pot? I didn't ask that. I knew why you smoke pot. You smoke the pot because he doesn't know Jesus. If you're smoking pot, you don't need, or if, you're, if you know Jesus, you don't need pot, you know? You don't want to escape reality. You want to be in reality. Because reality doesn't get any better than having a relationship with Jesus. And so... Not everybody will know Jesus, but people will think they know Jesus. And so, if you gnosko, or if you know Jesus, then you're going to find yourself practicing, or you know, acting like a Christian, right? It just happens that way. Because he does mention, he says, you who practice lawlessness. He, so he puts the two together, though. I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So, if, if lawlessness was there in itself, it would totally have a different meaning. But what it, he's saying is that basically, when you know me, you're not going to practice lawlessness, right? Because you know me. But because you don't know me, you are practicing lawlessness, and you will not have eternal life. Um, the essence of believing, it's an act of the will, or an act of your heart. It's not necessarily like even understanding. Think how many people that have probably came to the Lord and truly don't even know what they're doing, right? I mean, honestly, when you go to somebody and you're like, if they've never heard about Jesus, and it probably is all foreign to them. And it's not necessarily, a, 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 they don't have a complete knowledge or understanding of Jesus and the Father and the Trinity and all this stuff. They, they don't know, but they don't even need to know all that. Like Paul said, right? I told you one thing. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Like that simple thing. And then by believing, you know, an act of the will, an act of the heart, you can believe in Jesus just like you believe a historical person, right? Like Abraham Lincoln or whatever. And that's, but that's not trusting in Abraham Lincoln, right? There's a good one. You're not trusting in that historical and so faith isn't grasping doctrine, 
but faith grasps your, it's grasping your heart. And so the trust that Jesus requires, I saw it last night, it was incredible. And that was one of my prayers for him was, God, I pray you give him saving faith. Because that's where our faith comes from. Give him the faith that he needs to accept you, Lord. To trust you. To follow you. Saving faith is absolute confidence in Jesus. It's being sufficient for everything that you need in life. Jesus is sufficient for everything. You believe in him. You trust him. Let us get away from the cold intellectualism of belief into the warm atmosphere of trust, and we shall understand better than by many volumes what Christ here means and the sphere and the power and the blessedness of, of that faith which Christ required. I think that's really cool. And then Jer Jeremiah uh, 9.23 it says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am not that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. And so he knows me. And so I just love that. This is what this is, it says, for in these I delight. The Lord, he wants to know. He wants you to know him. He wants to be known by you. In verse 4, he said, Jesus is praying. He says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. So he says, I've glorified you on the earth. He's talking about everything that he did while he was on the earth, you know, teaching and being the example and showing them that he's, that when you see him, you see the Father. He's manifesting who God is. So he's, uh, he's glorifying the Father while he's been on earth and everything that he was doing. But then he says, I have, right? I have, if you read continuing in verse 4, I have thought about, or I've considered, or I've discussed. No, he doesn't say that. He says, he's not saying I've thought about finishing the work, or considered finishing the work, or I've discussed finishing the work, or, no, he says, I have finished the work which you have given to me to do. He says, I have done it. But he hasn't even really, he hasn't died yet. He hasn't gotten to the cross yet. But the way Jesus speaks, he's like, I glorified you on the earth. And then I also, he speaks in past, like it's completed already. I have finished the work which you've given me to do. As if it's already been accomplished, he's able to speak like that. And that's really cool because when, when Jesus sees you, he sees you as just, you're justified, but you're in the process of being sanctified, but he sees you as perfect. You're not perfect, I'm not perfect, but he sees me that way. And that's exactly how he sees how he, what he's talking about here. He's, it's already a done deal in his mind. He knows this is accomplished. And the last thing he has to do is he's just going to go basically surrender his life, right? But he sees us already made perfect. We're the perfect product of his grace. And that's how we need to trust God. It's in the same way that we're able to see things as he does. Because when God says something, it's going to happen, right? If you're reading your word and there's a promise, like you can hang on to that. That's true. Or if the Lord is speaking to you, like you can totally bank on that as if it's already done, as if it's already accomplished because you know he's faithful. And so I think that's really cool that Jesus is speaking in that manner in relationship to how I think we as well should have that same confidence, right? That same, that we see as God sees. Not just as, because if I see myself the way I see myself, but then I'm never going to go before the Lord because I'm, I'm guilty. And I'm ashamed. And I'm condemned, right? But if I know how God sees me, he sees me as righteous. 
this is just crazy. And that's the reason why last night, when um, Caleb accepted Christ, he was just describing like how he felt afterwards. And everything he was describing, I know, what he was saying, he was trying to say that basically he's righteous before God. I mean, he didn't really know how to explain that. But to have that peace that's beyond any understanding to know that you, now, that you couldn't even go before the Lord, now you can go before him because he sees you as righteous. That's just amazing. Um, and to see someone experience that for the first time is so cool. And I remember that, and I know you can remember that when you think that, that I think that's part of the peace that comes instantly with salvation that we, maybe we don't even really think about. I mean, yeah, it's cool that God's our, he's eternal, he's powerful, he's on your side and all that. But when it really comes down to it, the, the big thing is that you're righteous. Because now, because you're righteous, you can have a relationship. And that righteousness gives you freedom, you know, like nothing. There's no other way that you can be right before God. And when you, when you are experiencing that, now you're able to have a relationship. Now you can know him. You know? Before that, you couldn't know him. You, you, you couldn't know him at all. You're just an instrument of unrighteousness. You know? all, you're, all you can think of is you just remember the things that you're ashamed of. <laughs> In verse 5, Jesus says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And so this is really cool because we all know that Jesus created the earth, right? He created everything. We know that Jesus didn't, he wasn't created by God. We know that he was there with God in the beginning, right? And But Jesus is speaking about the glory or the, the place that he was in at that time before he took on flesh before he took on skin. He was just God. And then he becomes man. Still God, but he added to his deity. And Jesus is speaking of this time when he is going to go back to when it was before. And you can really hear Jesus like, like he's longing the same as us, is for this relationship to be better with God. Because he had this perfect relationship with but now they're separated, you know what I mean? But they're one. But I mean, I can't even go too deep into that because it blows my brain. But it's the same as us. He joined us in a sense of we're with God, we're one, we were, the Holy Spirit's in us. But we're, we want to have this relationship. We're desiring this relationship where it's going to be perfect. And you're not going to have any more sin. And your thoughts aren't going to be wicked. You're going to have pure thoughts. And you're going to be able to go to the Lord and love Him and glorify Him. Not because you went to him and asked him to give you the power to glorify him, but you're already going to be able to do that. That's just amazing. I think. And so Jesus is like, you can hear, he's just basically longing to be back in that fellowship with the Father, how it was before. And he's just also, you know, from reading what we just read, that he knows this is going to please the Father. And so he's excited to go to the cross because he knows that he's accomplishing God's will, and this is what the Lord delights in, that he would do this. But the thing is, when we, if I was the one praying, I would be probably saying, I would leave out the part that says, with yourself, right? If you take that part out and it says, glorify me, glorify me, right? But Jesus doesn't say, just glorify me. He says, glorify me with yourself, together with yourself. And so again, he's not saying all glory to me. You know, he's like, glorify me, just like in verse one, that I will glorify you. And they're one, they're being glorified. He's not, we know that he um, he's equal with God, but he didn't consider himself, you know, equal to God. Right? As, as, as far as like like Satan, right? Satan wanted to be above God, that he was better than God. No. Um, and so Jesus, when he prays this, he says, Glorify me, but together with yourself. And hopefully that's the way we become in our walk with God, as we mature in our relationship with God, that we become less self less self-centered. That that we would pray in the same way. You know, that we would pray, Lord, glorify me, but glorify me that I glorify you, you know. 
Um, it's not about my glory, um, but God used me. And so it's okay. Pray for yourself. You need to. You can't do it without Jesus. You can do nothing without him. So you need to pray for yourself. We know Moses, he faced, uh, remember, the glory of God. He, it was, he saw that it was God passing by in Exodus 34, 29. It was the afterglow, basically, right? And we know in uh, Exodus 33, 20, basically God, he couldn't show Moses his whole glory because no man could withstand the glory of God. Nobody could withstand God's, like, before God's face and live. And in Chronicles, or 2 Chronicles chapter 7, um, the glory of God that we read where it fills the whole temple and it drove everybody outside. And so, uh, in Daniel 10, we see Daniel, an awesome man of God, he falls on his face just because he's before the glory of an angel. So imagine how much greater it would be to be before the glory of Jesus, before the glory of the Lord. And so Jesus' prayer we see, we see that it gets answered. The Father answers his prayer. In case you didn't know, Jesus resurrected, right? Jesus resurrected. His prayer was answered partially in his resurrection, but the other part was in his ascension. He ascended to the Father. And he sat down at the right hand of the, of the throne. And he's glorified. He's, now he is where he is at now is where he was before the incarnation. And in the process of this whole thing of Jesus being obedient, surrendering, uh, praying for us and loving us, dying for us, and all of this was so that the price would be paid and so that we would be able to be accepted before the Father. And so, I just pray that this week, when you're praying, that you're able to, the enemy wants to distract you. He wants to tell you the way you look and remind you of your past or, you know, the things you've done. But we, we know how God sees you. He sees you as righteous. He sees you as perfect. And so, go before him. And go boldly before him and go before him praying for yourself first. That's good. Right? It's not bad. I think that's crazy to think that that's bad. Um, I always call it my cheater prayer because I feel like I'm cheating kind of. You know, because I'm like, God, I don't want to do this, but will you make me want to do this? That's not, but it's not cheating. That's just being honest before the Lord. And when you're honest before the Lord, that's when he changes your heart. You know, that's when, that's when you find yourself um, being used by God because you're out of the way, you know? And so, I just pray this week, man, as you think about what Jesus had prayed, he's praying for himself first, then he's gonna pray for the disciples, and then in the end he's gonna pray for the church, and we're part of that. And so, but for this part, as we look and we see Jesus praying for himself, and we look at the glory of God, um, and whenever you go through, just read the chapter all the way through over the next couple weeks, because next week we'll pick up on uh, him praying for the disciples. And uh, so read through it. So next time when we go through those next scriptures, you'll be prepared and the Lord can speak to you through his word. You know? Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I love you, Father, and Lord, it's uh, incredible that we are able to actually like we were there Lord, hear you pray and Lord you know that we're hearing you pray and so you pray with that in mind knowing that we're here and so you're saying to the Father the things that, that you want to say in this relationship that you have with him and at the same time God you're showing us this relationship that you have with, with the Father and there's just so much in that, God, that 
that you can see that we can apply to our lives, Father. But I pray that we will. Lord, I pray that we're able to have faith and that we're able to see things God has already included, God, just as, as you did, Lord, as you do. When you see us, you see us as righteous. And just to see you speak like that is pretty awesome. And Lord, I just want to pray that uh, for Caleb, as Lord, he came to you last night, and those other boys, they knew they were on holy ground because they saw what took place, God. I don't know, they probably can't explain it. I mean, I can't even explain it. Other than it was a divine appointment. It was the Holy Spirit, Lord. You moved and you reached out to a young man. You gave him eternal life last night. He was born again. Not just living life a long time, but God, you gave him a quality of life living in you for eternity, Lord. And so I just pray that God, as he's going to come, he says it's Wednesday. I pray that he makes it till then, protect him as the enemy hates him and wants to come against him, destroy him. I just pray that all of us, Lord Jesus, you would remind us this week to pray for Caleb. And uh, that you would wrap your arms around him and he would be a sponge, God, and read your word. And that you would just transform him, God, and strengthen him and use him mightily, Lord. And I pray for all, all the youth group, God, the same. Uh, the ones that don't know you, I pray that they would come to know you. Lord, I pray for that young lady, God, that came last night. Lord, I believe she knows the enemy is true, the enemy is real. And God, if she knows that evil is real, and I know she knows that you're real as well, so I pray, God, that she would turn to you, Lord. That she would truly find you, Lord. That you would find her, God. And open her eyes to you. And Lord, as we're just glad Halloween's over, and uh, Lord, we don't share any of the celebration uh, with Satan, God, with the enemy. God, every day we wake up and we celebrate you, Lord. We wake up and we put you first, God. But Lord, we struggle, and uh, we have the flesh, and so we pray, God, that you help us, Lord. Will you help us that we can glorify you in any way we do? God, will you help us to understand when we read your word? Will you give us the desire to even want to read your word? Would you give us the desire to want to be available to serve you? Would you give us the desire to even, and the boldness to open our mouths to share the gospel with people we don't even know? God, we have to pray for, for us because we, we can't do it without you, Lord. And uh, even your faith, even faith comes from I don't know how that works, Jesus, but you gave us saving faith. Uh, you found us, God. We didn't find you. And so we do pray for us, God, first, but it's that we would glorify you in any way we do, God. And Jesus, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being obedient. Thank you for going to the cross. And thank you for not just being in control. As we saw, hour, every hour, they, they kept trying to kill you at different times, but it wasn't time. And then now at this divine time, God, as we're reading in Scripture, it is the hour, it is time. And God, your plan was fulfilled through your Son, Jesus Christ. We just thank you for that, Lord. Thank you, God, that we live post the cross. And we just pray, God, that Fill us, use us, prepare us for everything that's ahead, God, until you come, until you return and take us home, Lord. We love you, we pray you. In Jesus' name, everyone say, Amen. 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 One more song.